uh, welcome uh, everyone to this uh, to this online discussion. Uh, 75 years since uh, blind spots in World War II history. Uh, my name is Kristina Smolyaninovaita. I'm a deputy director at the Secretariat of EU Russia Civil Society Forum, based in Berlin. Uh, the forum was established in 2011 by non-governmental organizations, and it is a platform of, at the moment, uh, 185 NGOs from Russia and the European Union, which are members and supporters of the forum. I am also managing the history program of the forum, Confronting Memories, that deals with historical memory. And uh, with this program, we hope to create a space uh, for a dialogue with diverse perspective on the history of the 20th century. Uh, currently, our program Confronting Memories focus on work with history teachers from Belarus, Germany, Poland, Russia, and Ukraine. And I know some, some of the teachers are also here in the audience. Uh, they are designing uh, lessons on World War II using a multi-perspectivity approach. Uh, multi-perspectivity is for us a strategy for understanding in which we look into other perspectives in addition to our own and apply it in history lesson materials. Um, there is no black and white, but we try to find the shades of gray in World War II history. Um, we make our efforts to find points that unites us and uh, have empathy to each other, despite difficult political contexts that some nations may experience. Uh, today, we continue a series of discussion on the commemoration of World War II and ongoing social political debates revolving around its historical memory, um, we work with the topic on World War II because this war remains one of the most painful and conflicting episodes in the memories of nations across the, the world. Um, world War II touches everyone. Uh, it is also difficult to say for me it was one World War II. It was many wars in, in, in one big war. Uh, there were different fights, different enemies, different wars, and this can be also observed today. Uh, so we started with our series of, of talks uh, on World War II last September, where we focused more on, on European context. Then later, uh, we, dis we had a discussion uh, which, was, uh, uh, fo which was focusing on Far East, in particular Japan and South uh, Korea. Um, and now this discussion, we shall look into three geographical blind spots in World War II history. It is North Africa, the Middle East and South America uh, with topics that have not been uh, discussed adequately. And um, we hope and with this discussion to, and seek with this discussion a broader understanding of World War II history uh, beyond the mainstream narratives and we will try to draw lessons from uh, human sufferings and injustice that are um, often overlooked. Um, this event today is uh, done in partnership with our friends and forum members, the Jan Novak Jezoranski College of Eastern Europe in Wroclaw and the New Eastern Europe Journal, um, which is published by the college. Um, here, I would also like to thank two, two persons who helped me to uh, um, conceptualize this uh, particular discussion on blind spots. It's uh, Professor Dajin Yang from George Washington University and my friend from Singapore, Wong Che Meng. And of course, my, my dear colleagues at the Secretariat who helps me and enormously to organize this discussion and, and this event. Um, so um, I would like uh, to give over now a word to our moderator, uh, Professor Dadden from University of Connecticut. So she would be also uh, introducing our speakers. So Professor Dadden, over you now. Thank you so much, Christina, and uh, thank all the audience members for their interest in, in these topics and the European Union, Russia civil society organizations and universities that are sponsoring this event. 
I think uh, I was initially fascinated to learn of this event, uh, particularly through the notion of blind spots in World War II. I, I think many of us uh, in the middle of this rather surreal pandemic year around the world are faced with students who wonder why World War II matters anymore. And it matters especially as we can especially see forces of militarism rising and a lot of rhetoric echoing the, uh, the rhetoric prior to the outbreak of the Second World War, uh, which also turns focus on today's topics, today, the substance of today very much, North Africa, Latin America, and back to the Middle East, as places not considered at the forefront of World War II, and yet we all casually use the term world for world war, meaning the entire war, the entire world is engulfed in some connectivity to the events or absences of these events. And you know, always as an American citizen, the term blind spot is first and foremost because we have a triumphalist narrative about the Second World War, which apparently for most Americans is a complete victory without considering the costs of what that entailed. And for the last 75 or 76 years here, I do math in public again, uh, the United States has caused more death and carnage and ongoing war in a way that is not defined as a continuation of World War II, but perhaps might be best mediated as such. Here I'm taking, uh, because history as such is a blind spot for most Americans, and I'm taking my cue from the fabulous poet at President Joseph Biden's inauguration, Amanda Gorman. And let me please quote uh, one of the lines uh, from her wonderful uh, poem, The Hill We Climb, uh, about the practice of history. It's the past we step into and how we repair it. And I think that that, when we think about why considering World War II matters today, is to understand why history and the practice of history, learning and teaching history matters. As I understand it, history is an active verb, probably, and please forgive my French pronunciation, but faire l'histoire to do history, to make history. And that's what we're here doing. And when there are absences uh, and intersections among the absences, it's best to try to examine and excavate the reasons behind those absences, especially as we can tell that uh, similar economic imperatives exist again today, similar tensions exist again today as they did in the 1930s. We also exist at a time in, with the, in which the erasure of certain physical histories at the expense of preferred national memory is very much on the rise. This is perhaps most clearly evidenced right now in Poland, where some of our colleagues have stood trial for simply publishing that Poland participated in uh, the genocide of Jews and others. You know, this is a, these are demonstrated facts. That gets into the broader question of what history and memory are and what the differences in their political and social deployment can be. We very clearly see around the world a weaponization of history for preferred national memory. And uh, there, I have a colleague in the United States who comes from a country which shall remain nameless and they practice history at a university that shall remain nameless, but they very clearly defined the difference between history and memory for me. And that is that history does not, history wars, debates about history do not have the power, the emotional power to lead to a shooting war. Whereas memory wars can lead to actional actionable violence. And I, I put that out before we begin this conversation, which I think Christina most brilliantly explained is an effort to generate empathy. Empathy for multiple perspectives, especially those of us teaching students who've never heard of the actual histories involved. 
Without further ado, please let me introduce our esteemed panel of speakers today. Uh, and then I'll turn it over to each speaker for a 15 minute presentation. Open it up to the audience for conversation questions in the chat box. And I'll mention now that if you do not feel your question has been answered by a speaker, please feel free to direct emails directly to my University of Connecticut email, and I will make sure that the speaker gets receives your question. Um, I'm old, I'm not so good at multiple uh, devices. Professor Omar Bohm, of Professor of Anthropology of, at UCLA, the University of California, Los Angeles, has uh, deeply examined intersections of Middle East and North African histories, religious studies, regional violence, and with books that I, I've read, The Memories of, of Absence, Jews in Morocco, just a brilliant uh, understanding of a particular moment in the 20th century that I highly recommend. Also a recently co-edited book on the Holocaust and North Africa. Uh, Professor Ernesto Bohoslavsky of the Universidad Nacional de General Sarmiento in Buenos Aires, long a, a researcher and student and brilliant interlocutor of 19th and 20th century Latin American revolutionary history as well, more in what I'm working on, so I've learned a lot, right-wing movements, ideology, the connection and interstices between Latin American anti-communism and Asian communism. Really some, uh, I wish I read Spanish better, but I'm trying and I'm learning from you, thank you. Uh, one of my colleagues at the University of Connecticut is helping me with that. And uh, Professor Joseph Pau of the uh, American University in Beirut, a pretty well-known uh, public intellectual as well as a deep thinker intellectual about Syrian Lebanese, uh, identity politics, as well as political histories and the need for governmental reform across the Arab world. Each of these distinguished uh, professors brings to our conversation today an understanding of global absences in World War II discussions. So without further ado, uh, let me, let's go to Los Angeles now. Thank you. Okay. Let me first share my all right thank you uh, Alex Alex Alexis thank you so much for this introduction and it's really an honor to uh, share this virtual um, floor with Joseph and Ernesto and um, what I'm going to talk about is a very uh, is one element of the blind spots in this period of the war which is related to uh, a project that uh, arises from my interest as an anthropologist in oral history and stories and narratives of individuals and particularly refugees who fled the war in Europe and other parts of the world and ended up in North Africa before they came, they, they went either to the Americas via Lisbon, Portugal. So um, you raised, um, uh, Christina and Alexis, you raised this issue of the rise of populism and nativism and nationalism and how that really creates borders and distances individuals and societies from each other. And I think that's really pertinent in the spirit of the war. And, and, and that's why I think it's important as educators to pay attention to refugees and to stories of people who are displaced. I'll tell a story on the other side of the, the southern part, of, from the southern part of the Mediterranean. And it's a story that's all over North Africa, from Libya all the way to Morocco, and even including some part of, some part of, uh, of West Africa. So this is a, as, uh, just to give you, for those of you who are not familiar with the, with the, with the region, uh, North Africa was a, mostly an, uh, colonized by uh, France, uh, you have French Morocco, but you have also in Morocco, the, the, the northern part and the, and the southern part were colonized by Spain. Um, Algeria was part of, of, of France, so it was a, a departement within 
uh, within the within greater within greater France, Libya was the only place that was uh, colonized by by Italy, and of course Tunisia also was a French colony. Um, in this in this in this um, colonial period, going back to 1939, um, and especially after Vichy um, took over in 1940 uh, in the summer of 1940. The um, Pétain, General Pétain, decided to revive a dream that Greater France had, which is a dream of connecting the Mediterranean to the rest of the Sahara and West Africa through a railroad, a railroad uh, system. And this idea here is basically to, con to build a, a, a railroad system that would allow France to revive its power, especially after its defeat in 1870. Uh, that dream, France wanted to make it a reality through by using the labor of a lot of people who were, who fled, who fled the, uh, Europe. And that's why actually, if you, if you watched the film Casablanca, you would see that there is one phrase where you talk about les cons, les cons de, les cons de travaux forcés. That's, I think that that's, all of, these, all of these dots you see here, those are at some point war camps, were either detention camps, labor camp, or, um, um, uh, uh, sorry, detention, labor camp, or concentration camp. There, is no, there were no death camps in this region, but these mostly were, were camps where they were meant to either um, include or put refugees, whether women or children or men in some camps, or whether they use them for this for this for this uh, project, the railroad system project, and of course uh, we have a, uh, a small section of West Africa. There were also some camps in Sub-Saharan Africa and West Africa, especially in in Senegal, in Mali, and in Guinea. So this is the uh, the, the project would end in Oran, at least in the first phase of it, and would begin in Sub-Saharan Africa, and then at some point would be connected. To Senegal. What's interesting here is that uh, you have about 10,000 um, at least refugees. You have Spanish Republicans, you have Jews, and you have also North Africans themselves too. So that's, I think, what um, uh, part of thinking about this history is really to figure out how this war impacted the lives of these, of these, of these communities. This is one of the, well, one of the remaining uh, uh, it, it's interesting to think here about the railroad in the story of Europe, the, how the road takes to the death camps, how the ro road takes to the labor camps. It's interesting even within this camp, how people talk about shoes, how people talk about clothes and all of these. So, and one way to do it is to go, is to look at, use the uh, oral histories and use also um, biographies. One of the most important biographies that are left today are biographies by Max Ob, Diaro de Jelfa, the Diary of Jelfa. There is also a few diaries left by Muslims who were interned in these camps. Trois années de camp by um, Berkani, for instance. And then uh, we don't have a lot of documents from this region, but one of the things I'm, I'm, I'm pushing here as far as my research is really to make sure that we collect histories and stories of both Jews and Muslims and other Christians in order to write this story. And I think that would be essential to think about the war so that we don't, um, we don't marginalize and we don't silence stories of other groups in order to rewrite, to rewrite this history. These are just some of the maps, some of the pictures that, um, that highlight this is the camp of Jelfa. The, the idea of the camp also, a part of the, from a comparative perspective, if we want to think about the war, how the comparative, how we think and how we write this, this, the story of the war in Europe is also, we can do it also in, at least to enlarge, to enlarge the scope of thinking of students K, from K through 12 as well as, as university level. So this is one of the camps, this is the camp of Jelfa, and you can see the Marabou uh, tents, you can see also the, the whole construction, how it's, how it's, um, how it's different. Um, you can also, we can also use um, official documents. I am for combining the official documents, state documents, but without, without um, neglecting the oral histories, individual stories, because 
those are the ones that will really enlarge how we think about, or at least inform how we think about these stories. And uh, part of this is really uh, the, 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 the materiality of the war. The materiality of the war can be in terms of pictures, in terms of clothing, but also in terms of drawings. The drawings tell us a story of how, we, how this story is, it should be uh, told. Not only a story from um, uh, um, a Muslim perspective, but also could be from a Jewish perspective, a Christian perspective too. And um, I wanna end by uh, saying how, how we, as, as an anthropologist and especially a historical anthropologist, how we, what are the possibilities we have today to write about the war? Do we write about this period just in terms of ethnographies or do we write about it in different, in different forms? And what, I, what I'm pushing here, what I'm trying to think about being influenced by a lot of, a lot of scholars and a lot of uh, works of different, this influence is coming mostly from the needs of the teachers, K through 12 teachers that I work with uh, in different forms, is to think about the project of what I call writing, having a, a comic, a comic um, uh, story. And this is, this is part of a project that I'm working on with a, an Algerian artist. Um, uh, and this is basically, it's called the, uh, the Undesirables, and it literally tells the story of these refugees who fled, who fled the war, who are either ended up in detention camps or labor camps or um, uh, penal camps. And I will end it here. That's all I have to say. Omar, thank you so much for that excellent, excellent presentation. Uh, I must concur that what you've just emphasized before I get into a, a collective remark, reading has changed among students. And so your approach to create a manga, as we would say in Japan, a comic, a comic, a, a, you know, a comic history of these moments is critical because we can convey, we know that from Art Spiegelman's mouse, we know that from so many uh, really successful presentations, they're not necessarily different histories, it's a different way that we teach. And uh, I really applaud that effort. I can't wait to read The Undesirables. Without further ado, let's go to Buenos Aires. <laughs> okay, good morning, good afternoon. Um, uh, I have decided to present, uh, which are according to me, the two main uh, particular uh, Argentinian points of view and uh, ways to remember World War II. Uh, I have 15 minutes. I don't know if I will be able to, to talk about them. Uh, I, I mean, I try to do it in a very sketchy way. Uh, what I propose for this uh, discussion on, uh, is, is the idea that <clears throat> uh, it's interesting to think uh, which word the World War II impacts in a peripheral region. I mean, a region in which there were minor military operations and combats and where most of the nations did not participate formally or meaningfully in the war scenarios in, in Europe, mm -hmm. in Africa, or, or in Asia. So uh, what I'd like to suggest is that there are two particular and long lasting impacts of World War II over Argentine political machineries and representations. One is the idea of that the Peronist Argentina was a particular sanctuary for the arrival of a, of a great number of Nazi war criminals after 1945, and the other, the other long-lasting impact is a recurrent assimilation of our last dictatorship with the Holocaust experience. I think that those are our particular point, points of view about the, the world, the world war. Um, in 1945, there was a an electoral campaign in Argentina. One of the candidates was the Colonel Perón. In that year, uh, the Department of State uh, launched and published the so-called Blue Book, which contained many denouns about the connections between Perón and the Third Reich. Uh, that denounced 
the collaboration of Peron and his government with the um, uh, with the Nazi German and with the arrival of uh, refugees. That idea that was essentially uh, an electoral uh, device finally um, has, has become sort of permanent black legend on Peronism. Um, that, that idea was clearly reinforced by the presence in Argentina of relevant Nazi authorities, Croatian Eustatia, um, French collaborationist, also uh, by one of the Mussolini's sons who lived in Buenos Aires for many years, um, the kidnapping of Adolf Eichmann in the outskirts of Buenos Aires in 1960. Well, that, that facts clearly reinforced these international suspicions on the complicities between Peronism and, um, and the Third Reich uh, war criminals. This version has received since then a great attention, especially in the US, where regularly are produced TV shows, documentaries, and journal pieces about this supposed massive arrival of Nazi war criminals, and submarines, treasures. No? You have even the, um, the more esoteric versions that include a particular, uh, that include the version of uh, Hitler having his last days in, in Patagonia no? as, an, as, an, as an elderly man. Um, this idea, uh, finally, th this perspective on, uh, on the links between Peronism and the Third Reich, uh, finally has, uh, I think it has a, uh, a well-documented version after the 90s. In a previous uh, discussion, Christina referred that some history teachers in Central Europe schools affirmed that the World War II uh, really ended in 1989, not in 1945. No? Well, let me tell you that probably in Argentina, the World War II finished even later. In 1992, there was a bomb attack against the Israel embassy in Buenos Aires. In 1994, there was another bomb attack against uh, the Jewish Community Healthcare Association that caused approximately 100 uh, uh, dead people. That episode, um, those attacks uh, were followed by pressures from the US government, Israel government, and also the local Jewish community in order to find the intellectual authors and the direct responsibles for, for the attack. Uh, the attacks were perceived as the result, not just of a very, very bad intelligence apparatus, but also as the consequence of a supposed long lasting sympathy to, to the Nazi point of view uh, in the, what we call, call the, the Argentine deep state you know, in, in the intelligence community. Um, so that supposed uh, Nazi sympathy in, in, in intelligence apparatus uh, was responsible for establishing this particular cooperation links with the Muslim terrorism in the 90s. Um, so that, that, that Nazi sympathy in the 90s was considered to be not just a potential, but an actual nutritive soil uh, for the ethnic hatred in, in the country. Um, so the idea of that Argentina was uh, um, was a long-lasting anti-Semitic uh, hatred and complicity that had to be uh, removed from the very roots. So the President Menem decided to uh, open the access to all the public archives that could contain information about the arrival of European war criminals. And he went further by creating a special commission on Nazis activities in Argentina, uh, a commission to research on those topics, which was composed by very well-known historians from, from Europe, from Israel, from the US and from Argentina. 
that commission made a great job in the 90s. They, they traveled to, I don't know, to Croatia, to Germany, to the US. They, they made all the archives, they made it public. So now we have a very, very well documented information on the arrival of war, war criminals. And what we know is that uh, this idea of that Argentina was a sanctuary, uh, an open, open airport for, for the criminals must be seriously reconsidered. Uh, Professor Holger Medin estimated that approximately between one and 2% of the main leaders, of the main Nazi leaders uh, eventually arrived um, to Argentina after World War II. Among the SS chiefs, uh, only Alvin Slevin arrived to, to our country. Uh, among the Einsatzgruppen chiefs, only one of them came to the country. Um, a random study over 100 Nazi leaders and state officers um, uh, offered uh, a very in, a very offered very important facts. Uh, this was a this was a sample study made on a base of almost 5,000 Nazi leaders and state officers. It was estimated that approximately. 2% of them finally came to, to Argentina. According to this uh, collective research, uh, the Nazi leaders who arrived to the country were 70. Uh, what is interesting to know, uh, what, what, what we could mention as a blind spot, is the fact that uh, arrived much more uh, French and Belgian collaborationists than German people. It was estimated that more than 100 French and Belgian collaborators moved to, to Argentina. Uh, the French and the Belgian government requested the extradition of some of them, but all the requests were systematically uh, denied by Argentine authorities. In fact, the, some French collaborationists um, reach a very comfortable economic and political position in the country. Uh, one of them, Saxe Marie de Marier, uh, who was uh, an old uh, um, um, comrade of uh, Action Francaise, um, finally became sort of a um, Peronist intellectual. He directed the um, um, political. Uh, Sort of political school, a Peronist political school in the in the in the sixties, and probably Argentina was was more a sanctuary for the Croatian war criminals than for the Sherman. No? Ante Pavelic, the the leader of the uh, of the Ustasian, lived in Argentina uh, with other thirty important Ustasha Ustasha leaders. So. Uh, when we think about if this story of the red lines of the war criminals that who, who reach Argentina uh, is taught, uh, I think that it's important to perceive that probably uh, is considered to be uh, uh, historical content to be taught, but that is identified as, um, as an anti-Peronist content to be taught. So probably uh, those teachers who decide to, uh, to say something about this story in their classrooms are also politically motivated. You know? And so, so those who decide not to talk about these stories are also politically motivated since it becomes a sort of an uncomfortable um, topic to be, to be treated. I mean, it's uncomfortable because it can produce some kind of F of effect nowadays. No? So it's it's a sort of a living past. Uh, the other, the, the second the second topic that I would like to talk about is is this particular uh, assimilation that was made after 1983 between the Holocaust experience and the Argentine dictatorship. 
it's interesting that this assimilation was encouraged, for instance, by artists as Leon Ferrari, who made great paintings um, with the images of Hitler and uh, Videla, uh, the national dictator, uh, which uh, um, some kind of colleges and paintings in which you can find um, images of Auschwitz and the national concentration concentration camps. Yeah. Um, but that simulation was also made by um, judiciary agents as prosecutors and judges. Uh, they used the they used terms and also uh, laws on uh, discussions that were used in Nuremberg in order to condemn the dictators. Uh, that assimilation is used also by the victims when they offer uh, their, uh, uh, when they speak about their, their experience. But it's interesting that that assimilation has a sort of a perverse side, which is that in many, many torture rooms during the dictatorships, the victims have identified that there were Hitler's portraits, and also uh, the, used as intimidatory, intimidatory uh, pieces. Um, there was a during the dictatorship. There was an overrepresentation of uh, of uh, Jewish victims among uh, among the the kidnapped and the murdered. Um, there are a lot of denounces of that the torture sessions were even, even tougher for uh, Jewish, Jewish people, and they received specific anti-Semitic uh, courses during the, the torture sessions. Um, in 1985, there was a very famous for us trial against the, the dictators, the, the perpetrators. And interestingly, the documentary of that trial, it's called the Argentine Nuremberg. So it's, it's our Nuremberg version. Uh, in the last uh, 15 or 20 years, this assimilation has continued to reproduce and to spread. Uh, in 2010, uh, the ministry, uh, the education ministry, Launch on a special program called uh, um, Education and Memory. They have produced very important, rich, interesting textbooks about how to teach Holocaust and how to teach uh, dictatorship. Uh, in the in the words that the that the program used to uh, introduce one of the textbooks are this. Not all the societies created concentration and extermination camps. That's why asking ourselves about the conditions that made the camps possible becomes a responsibility as educators and also as citizens. In this sense, reflecting on an experience as the Holocaust can shed light on the Argentinian case. So this assimilation is not just, uh, it's not random, it's politically based. No. It has a pedagogical use. The idea of that the uh, civiliz civilizatory challenge that the Holocaust offered to the, to the humanity was repeated in Argentina during the dictatorship. In, in, uh, I would say more that this, uh, this term of genocide, which is, which is used uh, very frequently here, has become a sort of uh, intense uh, quarrels uh, among scholars, but also uh, within the uh, within the chassis, uh, within the within the, the judiciary you know, about if it's uh, if it's possible, if it's legitimate, uh, if it's uh, if it suits to the to the Argentine experience. Uh, Anyway, in spite of that you have a lot of uh, legal problems to use the term genocide, uh, it's impossible. I think it's impossible to uh, stop uh, uh, the the social use 
usage of, of the term. In fact, the term genocide has begun to be used in order to refer to military campaigns at the end of the 19th century, you know, military campaigns against indigenous societies. So uh, what we can perceive is, I will finish with this, is this, there's another particular heritage of the World War II and the Holocaust experience, which is reenacted by the Argentinians in order to think themselves and in order to uh, include their particular uh, violent history into a larger stream of the 20th century disgraces. That's it. Thank you. Ernesto, thank you so much. And uh, I look forward to the conversation following, uh, particularly your, your on-spot point about the social conditions that make camps possible. And I think that's a sort of globality that comes out. Uh, it certainly starts in the 19th century and can connect uh, transnationally. I also really liked uh, your criminality, collaboration, and complicity. Uh, framework. Uh, onward to Beirut. Yeah, uh, thank you, Alexis. Uh, good evening, everyone. And uh, I mean, good morning, depending on where you are. Uh, in fact, I, um, <clears throat> I was a bit um, puzzled when, when I was proposed to participate in this, in this panel, because I, I didn't know exactly what to talk about. Uh, concerning the Middle East, because uh, in a way, uh, in the collective memory and the historiography of this region, uh, the, the most important uh, tragic event of the 20th century is more uh, World War I than World War II, at least uh, in the Levant, in the part of the world which uh, I, will, I, I will tackle. I mean, uh, Syria, Lebanon, Iraq, Palestine, and etc. Uh, World War I is, is exactly, uh, first of all, um, the, the period under which uh, the Ottoman Empire will, will crumble after four centuries of domination, like all other empires in, in the Western world. Uh, but also it's uh, concomitantly the, the period of the state formation. Uh, the, the, the borders are drawn uh, uh, within the period of uh, post-World War I, and World War I itself is for the people of the region, at least in Syria and Lebanon, a very uh, traumatic memory in terms of uh, tragic events, famine, um, uh, fled, emigration. Uh, 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 Ernesto is Argentinian and he knows that probably most of the Turcos of the Syrian Lebanese uh, emigrants to Latin America have fled during World War I because they were fleeing uh, terrible plights like famine, massacres, displacement, mass displacements, and etc. Compared to that, uh, of course, I mean, uh, Second World War was also a, a very, a very uh, marking event in, in the Levant and in the Middle East or in the Near East. But compared to World War One, it was really benign, and uh, I would say for some. Uh, parties may be fortunate and not unfortunate. It was a period of independence, of emancipation, of um, elite uh, taking over uh, the countries in Syria, Lebanon, uh, in Jordan, in, uh, in, in Iraq, maybe. Uh, it was the period where we can also trace maybe, and I'll come back to that, the birth or the creation of a state of Israel. So uh, it was not exactly uh, the same, let's say, uh, the same way it was lived uh, elsewhere in, in the world. Uh, now, if I, uh, this is, I think, a very important, uh, a very important reminder, because if you interrogate uh, public memory, collective memory, historiography, and, and, uh, and other documents, uh, you find much more, uh, uh, concentration of, of events and tragic uh, traces pertaining to World War I than to World War II. Uh, in a nutshell, if I have to summarize this point, I would say that World War I was the period of formation of nations and states, and World War II was uh, more the period of their uh, coming to independence and political fruition. 
Uh, now, if I have to think about uh, what are the blind spots or the things that we don't talk enough about in this region uh, during World War II or, or having to do with World War II, uh, some things come to my mind. The first one is, at least for Syria and Lebanon, uh, something that is not documented enough, uh, which is the Franco-French uh, competition and rivalry. Uh, we tend to forget that when when World War One, uh, World War Two uh, starts, uh, this part of the world, Syria, Lebanon, at least, is and this is a direct consequence of World War One of the Sykes-Picot Agreement and other agreements. Uh, this part of the world is under French mandate, uh, but so when France falls under the occupation and and under the Vichy rules, these two countries are in the beginning under the Vichy rules. And there is a very quick competition and rivalry that is not exactly military. And this is what, what, what's interesting between uh, the Gaullist forces and the Vichy, the Petenist forces in these two countries. And we barely find uh, books, articles, uh, documents, uh, images, pictures, and other documents and traces about the way um, uh, the power was, was transferred or handled from uh, vicious France to, to Gaullist France. It happened uh, somewhere in 4041. And it's interesting because at that moment, the Gaul will visit Beirut in a very uh, historical visit. And there's still a building here in Beirut, in an old neighborhood of Beirut, uh, bearing a kind of, of plague, uh, reminding this, this historical visit he will spend maybe several weeks or several one or two months here in Beirut. And this has constructed a lot the, 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 the mythology of the bond between Lebanon and, and Gaulist France after that. Uh, it, in itself, it was a very anecdotal event, not very important, but it took importance later on. I mean, like many other uh, mythologies or legends that are over-constructed a posteriori, but so we don't know enough about this transfer of power between uh, Vichy France and, and Gaulist France. And this is, I think, one of the issues that would uh, uh, be worth for historians to, to maybe inquire a little bit more and to delve into it. Because also it has to do, and, and this is maybe another question, it has to do also with um, part of the elite formation of Lebanon and Syria after the independence. Uh, most of these elites were very much tied to France before the war. Uh, most of them were Francophone, Francophiles, uh, studied in France, uh, high bourgeoisie families that used to have property in Paris, spend their summers in France and etc. And I think it is very interesting to see how they managed to move themselves, their loyalties from one camp to another, which is, I don't want to be cynical and, and, and silly also, is something very familiar to the elites in this part of the world, shifting very quickly loyalty and allegiance from one occupier to the other. And I heard that there are some correspondences, some letters from the same persons, from the same notables, writing to uh, the, the French high commissioner, who is a Vichy uh, uh, civil servant, letters of uh, complete allegiance and, and loyalty to France under Pétain, and then the week after or the month after writing the same letter to, uh, to the new high commissioner of the Gaul, uh, saying exactly the same thing and people asking, I mean, who, what exactly uh, is this guy standing for? Uh, and, and this is something that we are unfortunately still living uh, into uh, in this part of the world. Uh, mainly in Lebanon, I should say, unfortunately. The second blind spot that is much resembling to this one has to do later on in the 42-43 period with the Franco-British competition. And also, this is an interesting point because we tend to think that, of course, there's a, a, a Franco-British bloc against Nazi Germany and Italy and etc. But in fact, the competition between France and, and Great Britain that you can, of course, uh, read and look at in London itself between Churchill and de Gaulle and, and the kind of uh, uh, irritation between the two men who both had a, a very acute sense of history and their place and role in history, uh, of course, differently, but uh, 
more or less the same in expression, uh, it played out in Lebanon and Syria. And we can even say, and, and I think historians have worked on that, that independence in Lebanon and Syria, that was also, it's interesting to note that it will happen during Second World War, not after Second World War. It happens in 43, in November 43. It is a direct result of probably a, a very uh, sideshow of rivalry and, and conflict between London and Paris. And this is where the elites, the notables uh, I was talking about a minute ago, in Lebanon and Syria will steal in a way, will seize the moment of this rivalry in order to uh, uh, steal independence in a way. I mean, to take it uh, in, in a kind of uh, maybe moment of inattention by both French and German uh, and, and, and uh, Britain, which is also something uh, I think very interesting. Uh, now, of course, the French will physically evacuate Lebanon and Syria in 46, but the independence is proclaimed uh, at a moment where both these countries have much more important things to do and where France, in fact, does not exist. Uh, France is not France. France is, uh, as the maps that Omar has, has shown a, a, a while ago, was divided, was torn, uh, legitimacy, political legitimacy were, was, was inexistent or divided and, and torn. And this is an interesting moment in political history to think about an independence that is taken under such a, an international, let's say, context and, and conjuncture. I think it's, it's very rare to have such a moment of uh, independence of a country that is occupied or under the tutelage of a country that is itself occupied and under tutelage and which government is, is frankly unknown. I mean, we don't know where France is, where official France is. And this is, I think, a second blind spot, which I think is, is interesting to, to inquire further. Uh, the third one is more touchy and more, uh, let's say, sensitive. It has to do with the, something that will occur mainly after Second World War, but we can trace the roots of to, uh, to the war itself and mainly also to things that has happened between World War I and World War II, which is in fact, the Zionist immigration to, to what will become later on Israel, the Zionist immigration to Palestine, and what was happening in Palestine, in the land of, of what is historically Palestine or uh, Transjordan and Palestine under the British mandate during the Second World War. Uh, of course, the legend or the historiography or the, the common sense tends to say that uh, Israel was created uh, in, in April, May 48, because of the guilt feeling of Europe under the Holocaust and the kind of compensation mechanism and et cetera, and that uh, the, the Jewish uh, lobby was able to extract or to, to seize the moment of the creation of Israel because of the post Second World War uh, period and, and, and the climate in Europe. It is, it is very, very partly true but we also tend to forget that some dynamics were already at play during Second World War, during the years of the plight of Jews and, and the Jewish population in Europe. There was something happening in, in, in what will become Israel and, and, and Palestine and the partition in 47 by the Jewish communities that were living in Palestine at that moment and not being submitted to the, to the persecution they were submitted to in, in Europe. And this is a part of history that has to do with uh, Israel, the history of Zionism, and the history of the Arab-Israeli conflict that is still uh, shaping and informing this part of the world that is underlit, underworked, on, under, under examined. Uh, of course, something else is under examined, uh, although it's a more, let's say, nasty and, and less, uh, I mean, less honorable part of the Har Arab history which is in fact the ties that were existing between some Arab elites, mainly Palestinian elites, and uh, Nazi Germany and fascist Europe. I mean, the ties between uh, the Mufti of Jerusalem that, that, were, that are well-documented between him and, and Hitler personally, his visit to Berlin, and uh, his hope maybe that uh, the problem of Palestine that was existing at that time already would be solved, quote-unquote, uh, through the eradication of the Jewish population in Europe. This is, I think, a very interesting point of history, 
especially if, and it has to do with things that Ernesto have alluded to, especially when you look at also, which something is, I mean, which is something fascinating to me, uh, some of the parties, the political parties and forces that will become very active and prominent after Second World War, in the first time of independence in some of the Arab countries, mainly Syria and Lebanon, trace back their origin intellectually and organizationally uh, to the period of the Second World War and to something that is more or less gravitating in the orbit of worldwide fascism and Nazism. I mean, if you take, for example, uh, the Syrian National Party that will become very strong in the history of Syria after the war and in Lebanon until today, uh, this is a party that is, uh, uh, first of all, created, and this will probably be interesting to Ernesto, it is created by a Lebanese expatriate in Latin, Latin America, Antun Saadi, who's from Mount Lebanon, a Greek Orthodox from Mount Lebanon, who will be uh, very much uh, shaped intellectually by ideas of, of uh, right-wing populism in Latin America, then will absorb a lot of doses of Nazi literature and fascist literature up to the level that he will become a, a scientific anti-Semite, uh, I mean, like uh, European anti-Semites. And he will develop his, uh, the ideology of his party very much along the lines of uh, the Volk, uh, the power of the people, uh, blood, bloody nationhood, and etc. Uh, and this is very interesting also because uh, this is a, a page of history uh, that is still uh, enduring and ongoing in this part of the region and really traces back to exactly what was happening during Second World War in other parts of the world and was important, uh, sorry, imported uh, to this part of the world, the Middle East. Um, I, I will not go further, but maybe uh, in a later stage uh, in the round of questions, we could maybe reflect on uh, the difference of temporalities and the way things are perceived and lived, uh, comparing World War I and World War II between our regions and, and the regions that we are examining today, and see which one was more formative and informative uh, for these region, for, for this or, or, or the other region. Thank you so much. Joseph, thank you, especially for ending with or concluding with different temporalities. And um, I've been taking copious notes here because uh, several of your, your points about a sort of a sideshow rivalry, the Franco-British competition, as well as the shift of loyalties uh, from one occupier to an another, especially as an American citizen watching uh, or observing the history of my country take over much of East Asia in the wake of the collapse of the Japanese empire, uh, you know, the shift of pull down the Japanese uh, flag and hoist this, the American flag uh, and send the same letter to MacArthur that one might have sent to Hirohito the week before. It's pretty fabulous. Uh, and we have a lot going on here. I think each of you has, has touched on state formation, uh, the importance of borders and fueling those with ideologies that depend on sort of transnational references to a history of horror and a history of violence, uh, something that permeates each of these, these discussions. Uh, we have several questions in the chat box. I could talk forever because I'm learning so much and this is really, you know, it's a pandemic and I'm learning something I don't know. So I'm really excited. So I'll shut up now uh, until I get to ask more questions. Uh, but please, several of you have posed questions in Cyrillic and I can't read that. So if somebody could write some of them in English, we have one in English that I can read. My apologies for my lack of languages on this particular front. We have an excellent question from Rafael Pankowski, Never Again Association, that I'll just read and anyone on the panel or each of the panelists could respond. What do you think we can learn from the globality of World War II to build global solidarity across continents, 
con against contemporary instances of human rights abuses and genocide. Uh, and you know we can we can uh, perhaps Ernesto wants to begin with you know uh, revisiting. I think you're really brilliant insights to how this one touchstone that is the United Nations uh, first, you know, definition of genocide in the wake of the Nazi Holocaust. And yet we've got Raphael Lemkin using the Armenian genocide to define genocide, but the world needed to know about Nazis before figuring it out. And yet we have ongoing instances of genocide. And I should make clear, I am sitting on Native American soil uh, made possible by the genocide of the Pequots. Uh, so it's, you know, here we are. Um, would anybody like to address the globality of histories of World War II to address or to cope with ongoing histories of extreme violence? State, I should emphasize, the state-sponsored nature of the violence we're talking about. Okay, <clears throat> thanks, thanks, uh, thanks, Alexis, for 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 the, for the question. Uh, I do not have something very solid to say about, but um, I am. I could say I am skeptical about. Um, human capability to learn uh, about uh, about the past. Uh, <clears throat> when I be, when I I decided to study history, I felt exactly the opposite. You know? I, I thought that we could learn from our mistakes, and then I don't know. Living in a better world <clears throat> nowadays, I am a bit more pessimistic about that. What I could say is that probably. The World War II has spread feelings of uh, global solidarity, but did not invent them. I think, for instance, watching watching the problem from Latin America, I think that the Spanish Civil War was probably much more important in order to uh, stimulate these particular international identifications. You know, the perception of that. Uh, in in uh, in the Madrid battle, there were not uh, faced just two Spanish enemies, but two particular transnational enemies, which generated assimilation and also rejection. So the Spanish civil war contributed firmly to the development of these global solidarities. Um, that for sure combated, fought against other global solidarities. The fascist governments also launched their own global connections and solidarity movements. You know, it's clear that the fascist uh, side of the world was not as strong as the anti-fascist movements. But uh, uh, in my opinion, I think we, we have to think of globality much more as a contested uh, field, much more than as a universal stream potentially shared by, by all the people. I think that we could think much more in terms of uh, competitive, competing uh, global projects, more than uh, as, the, as the emergence of uh, unified global conscience. I think, uh, let me add something to, I think I'm gonna build on uh, uh, Joseph's really uh, pertinent contribution in terms of his thoughts about World War I versus World War II. And I think what, it, what Joseph is, uh, has mentioned is really connected to this question because first of all, we have to think about the, the meaning, the meanings of the war and the meanings of the trauma to each group. So I think which, 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 which is linked to somehow to, first of all, we have to translate the experiences of each groups. And before we start talking about the common, commonality, because every, every nation, every group within every nation is coming from, in terms of class, they're coming from their own perspective. 
And I think until we do that, that that's why, first of all, we have to learn more about the facts. And this is where the archives, history, oral history, and so on and so forth are important. Then when we get to these discourses of what's common and how we can build these solidarities, I think that's that's something that would come next. Are we there? I don't think so. I think I don't think we're I, I, we're not there yet. And uh, but we will be there. That's why a panel like this and the conversation with teachers like this are important. We will be there if we are able to translate these experiences to the students it, through their own languages and through their, the experience of their own people, the experience of their own communities. And and I, and I think that's. That's uh, potentially uh, the best. The best, I, I think, the best solution to building these these alliances in the future. Uh, Joseph, would you like to say something there? Yeah, uh, in fact, I, I don't have much to say uh, or to add, but I would uh, maybe bounce back on on the last uh, the last point made by Omar. What, what strikes me um, uh, in this part of the world. Uh, regarding World War II uh, is the very, uh, and, and this is where I, comple I completely concur with, with Ernesto about the pessimism or the skepticism about learning something from this on the global scale. What strikes me here in this part of the world is uh, the, 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 very in, the very deeply entrenched uh, denialism of certain things that have happened in, in, in Europe, for example, in Eastern Europe or in Europe. I think the, the Middle East, I, I don't know scientifically, but I have the feeling that it is probably the part of the world with, where uh, uh, denialism of the Holocaust and etc. is the strongest probably in, in the collective, in the popular discourse, in the popular, let's say, uh, narrative and etc. And uh, uh, this has to do, of course, with the Arab-Israeli problem, but uh, it is not read as a European traumatic traumatic event. It is read as a part of the Arab-Israeli conflict and not as part of the European history, the traumatic and very difficult European history. And uh, for for someone who, for example, like me, who teaches political history in, in the American university. I used to teach political science in France for, for, for 15 years. Now I've been teaching this in Lebanon and I can see how uh, the perception, the cultural per perception, the, the, the sometimes the conviction that is entrenched in, in the minds and the heads of the students is very different. Uh, they, they don't live the same event the same way. I, I, and sometimes they even deny that this event has, has happened or they minimize it. So we're still very far from having constructed a global awareness towards these issues. And, uh, and I think that I, I would agree with my two colleagues that this is something that will probably take a lot much, I mean, much more efforts and, and energy and probably intellectual input to construct. If I could just add in from East Asia, where I, I think we, uh, in East Asia, we run a close second, if not a neck and neck tie on denialism. Uh, the East Asian denialism of certain factual occurrences aided and abetted by the United States government's determination to sweep history under the rug in order to build an anti-communist bloc uh, at all costs immediately following the defeat of Japan to the extent that I think only in American high school or American history textbooks is the word good used with the atomic, with the nuclear bombings of Hiroshima and Nagasaki. It's an untranslatable word in any other nation's history, which I guess I would emphasize very much Omar's uh, especially to the teachers in the audience the uh, who are coming up with lesson plans of a multi-perspectival approach to this particular era of the 20th century, a multi, uh, the multiplicity of materials, um, um, the, as many different source materials as possible. Uh, those of us who are doing the speaking today all have our degrees at us. We've obtained our, our PhDs at times in which you needed a certain amount of certain materials to pass your exams. And there's a sort of hierarchy of documented 
archival evidence. Uh, Omar very smartly put up a US government document to show that a certain history had taken place. And we also have a diary, a first person account. And I think uh, for those teaching this in areas around the world today, uh, you, we're still in a position of hearing from survivors of some of these atrocities, some of these histories of terror that really do reach students in a new way. And I find that the first person voice, while of course always needs to be substantiated as any criminal trial would do, you know, you're making a claim against a state and making any claim against a state apparatus is probably the single most difficult thing to do, regardless of whether one's in a dictatorship or a democracy actually. And so bringing these claims forward through, uh, through diaries, through songs, through film footage, while it is still possible to bolster the argument with a living survivor, is, is key in terms of reaching students in a new way to explain the potential cataclysm of another war on this scale. And I, I, I don't mean to be the voice of darkness, but I am actually increasingly terrified of the, the rhetoric of the rise of China. I mean, the United States is clearly positioning itself to have another global conflict. Whether or not it comes to pass, we obviously hope does not happen. But it, the rhetoric is building in a way that one sees similar patterns in the 1930s. And therefore it's imperative on those of us who have access to the generation for which nothing is inevitable until it happens to introduce the costs of such cataclysmic violence. And uh, that's through individual stories, through the people caught in state webs of terror that bring it forward. And I agree with the panelists that finding a global World War II history, we're not there yet. Finding, um, I'm thinking of um, Ashil Mabembe's wonderful work, A Global History of Violence, I think we're closer to understanding and bringing it to the fore that way. Um, we have a question from Frank Fable. If memory on World War II is still contested, as Ernesto said, could it not be that the contest is which fraction has the better concept of a multi-directional memory? Everybody nowadays is multi-directional, even the extreme right. Anyone can take it. Okay, um, I'm, I don't know if, if there are more than one legitimate memory yeah. on the World War II. Uh, in my opinion, even, even, the, even the, the losing countries, the defeated countries, I think that shared uh, and teach the version that is uh, taught and remembered in the winning countries. Huh? Yeah. Uh, I think that we can perceive this with, with the celebrations of the end of the world, no? uh, the celebrations with the 75 years or with the 50 years. I think there are not competitive memories about the the global meaning of the World War II, I think that <clears throat> uh, only very marginal minor actors think that the war was won by, <clears throat> by the wrong guy, no? uh, uh, which is exactly opposite to the Leonard Cohen's songs. Um, so I think that we do not have a competitive legitimate versions about the, the World War II. I think that probably the, it's much more intense as Joseph has pointed out, the, the debate, the so-called debate about the Holocaust. No? I think that, that that's, that's becoming more and more a space where the most esoterical denialist and bad intention positions 
are, uh, are really acquiring legitimacy and audience. So I would be much more concerned about <clears throat> how Holocaust will be remembered, who will remember, uh, much more than by the problem of the memory of the World War II that, according to me, has become much more one of these typical uh, uh, historical national episodes that probably speak nothing to the new generations. You know? These kind of facts which are really dead. In my opinion, probably 1945, it's a, it's a, for most of the Europeans, it's a dead year. You know? in, in the sense that it does not generate this kind of uh, quarrels or, or intense discussions. Uh, I mean, in that sense, the, the, the process of building the European Union probably has uh, finally um, contributed to uh, depoliticize, depoliticize the, the memory about the war. You know? So finally, all of them became Europeans, but uh, not all of them became Jews and not all of them want to become shoes or to identify with those victims. So in my point, from my point of view, I think that I could watch with much more attention that discussion than the other one about the memory of the World War II. Uh, <clears throat> I tend to agree with Ernesto on this. I think, uh, and I think the, 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 um, the way we remember actually and how we really um, think about previous events. I can think of what the Germans did in Namibia, for instance, before even before World War before World War II, and um, I something also relate connected to Joseph's point about World War One. I. I think a lot of the 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 killing of Afri this is something which is also a footnote in the history of the war of World War Two. How how European powers, how the Germans, how the French, the Vichy. Uh, how they treated uh, sub-Saharan Africans, uh, how race is also became part of the anti, not, you have the anti-Jewish laws, but we have also anti-racial uh, racial laws against um, African soldiers that were killed, that many of them won the war. Uh, Europe won the war because of the, of the French tirailleurs, but we don't, we don't talk about them. But also, we don't talk about how World War II, the role of World, the role of the Senegalese tirailleurs in winning World War I for France impacted the way the Germans went about their racial laws through anthropology and other and other in, in the in the in the period of the, between the between the between the wars. So I think that's uh, I agree with you, and I think we have to really be cognizant of these of these past events. And how can we, the question is, how can we make people interested in these stories at a time where we are of, um, where people are interested in a different social encounters, social media and all these things. So, so that's how do you make history a topic of passion again to people? And, and, and that's the struggle. That's our struggle as, as educators. Thank you, Joseph. Did you have something there too? Maybe what, what I have to say here is, is not very much related to, to this point, but it has to do with it. I, I have the feeling, uh, maybe in line with what I said, that in fact, uh, in, in, the, in the Near East, in the Middle East, the World War II itself is a, is a blind spot in a way. Uh, let me say why. First of all, because World War I is more important in, in, in terms of creation of events but also because for many parts of the world, World War II was maybe the last real big war. Uh, in fact, in the Middle East, it was uh, only the start of a series of other wars that were really catastrophic. I mean, the Arab-Israeli War of 48, then the aggression of 50, uh, 56, and then the big war of 67, 
that uh, which consequences we are still living in, the occupation of the land of Jerusalem, etc. Then the war of 73, then the war of 82 in Lebanon, and then the Lebanese war, and then the Syria war, and then Libya. And so uh, if you compare this to the memory of other parts of the world, we could say that World War II was, uh, to paraphrase a very beautiful book on World War I, paradoxically, a war to end all wars, uh, in fact, World War II was the start of all wars for the Middle East. So, so in a way, it went into oblivion because it, it is something that went unnoticed. Uh, first of all, because there was no battles, in fact, properly speaking, in, in, in Lebanon, Syria, Iraq, Palestine during World War II, but everything started after that. So I think that also it's important to interrogate uh, the historical perception of people's uh, in this part of the world and other parts of the world and compare them towards one event. I think it's a fascinating uh, exercise also. I, I completely concur. Uh, Omar has just said World War II is a blind spot. I, I, I study Korea. Uh, there were no battles. Many, many Koreans had their lives uh, stolen from them and uh, forced into forced labor for the Japanese empire. Yet there were no battles in Korea. And yet Korea is, a, is the longest civil war we've got in Asia today, uh, still ongoing. So yeah, World War II was not over in Asia. It was the catalyst if World War I was not when Japan was on the Allies' side and then switched empires, as it were. So uh, we have time for questions that I may not be seeing in the chat or hearing from uh, the interlocutors. Are there questions that I don't know about that mm, should be addressed while we still have a few minutes? And if not, I have the one question that we've been asked that we have certainly, uh, each of you has touched on brilliantly, Omar, perhaps most uh, powerfully, uh, how, how do we make history matter uh, at a time when we have, I, I don't know if the American English expression fun fact is a global expression right now, but sitting here in my living room teaching history over Zoom for an entire year, I've come to think that the practice of history is now being reduced to fun facts. And um, I, without, without going into complete paroxysms of despair, uh, I still believe it matters because I believe, and it's a very weak understanding of the praxis of history, but it is precisely what we're discussing to try not to repeat the mistakes of the past, but to learn from the choices made which led, led to the devastating uh, violences of the past and to try to make the world just a little bit better. And I say this uh, when there are ongoing instances in each of our locations uh, that have echoes to what we've seen. And Omar, I'm glad you mentioned German Germans in Namibia because this predates World War I, it predates World War II and uh, the wars are ongoing. We have been asked if we had one thing each to say in terms of lessons learned, if you each have a one minute statement for teaching these blind spots and why they might matter. Um, if I could ask each of you to comment. Thank you. In any order. Okay, thanks. Thanks for this final um, impossible to answer question. <laughs> uh, no, I think that many things could be said about uh, which are the historian's burden, and especially the, the history teacher in the classrooms. Many things, in fact, were already said about that. Um, what I'd say, attending to the potential presence of teachers in the audience, is not to overestimate our capacities. I mean, I mean we have some responsibility, but we are not the responsible for the state of the world. So, uh, we can, we can, and we, in fact, we teach the students, uh, but we are not, we do, we do not 
have the complete responsibility for what what people do. So uh, I think that education matters, history matters, but uh, I am not sure if in 2021 is what really matters more. So probably uh, uh, we need a very we need much more activities outside the classrooms. We need more meaningful activities for, for the students. And the, the second thing that I could say is something that is also very well known among the teachers and among the, the scholars who study the memory. And is that uh, the only way to keep a memory alive is also betraying it. The only memory, the only way to keep a memory going and meaningful for the people is that it speaks about the present, not just as a statue of an old man that has to be glorified. So the only memory that really works is the one that is alive. So to be alive means that uh, has to stop talking just about the past that is dead and also has to speak every day more about current topics and concerns. Uh, so in that sense is that betraying the memory is uh, a very um, is unavoidable and probably it's a good evil that's it well that's a, that's a very tough question just like <laughs> but but i i think what i can say is that i'm very lucky as a human being as a person to be raised in a in a context where I've seen different generations, uh, and for us, history is taught through the wisdom of old men and women uh, who experienced World War One, who experienced World War Two, and their stories of famine, uh, how they can't even find cloth to bury the dead, have all these really minute, minuscule stories and anecdotes are very, very personal, very relatable. So they, you can relate to them. You can relate to the fact that somebody was going through World War I in the 1943 and people, there is a famine, there is a war. The French, the Germans are directing the food supplies to, from France to, to uh, mainland Germany. And then the French can't provide the flour to the colonies. And then he listening to these stories to uh, through the voice of my father, for instance, uh, uh, that's that what made me aware of the importance of the war. Why why these things matter? Why do you think to, why do I need to teach them to my daughter? But then when I listen and I look at my daughter, my daughter doesn't want to read uh, a uh, a two hundred pages book. So I have to find a way how to relate to her again, how to tell the story. And I, I, the fascinating things about I see about this new generation is that the, the visuals. So for me, that's where the, the comic and the graphic novel came. So I want to tell my I want to tell this story, the same story that I heard from my dad and from generations of my dad to my daughter and to hopefully generations and, and kids her age. So we have, as, uh, as Ernesto mentioned, this idea we have to make it part of the present. And to make it part of the present, we have to make sure that it's we relate it relates to first of all what we lived and how our kids can actually listen to us because you can't teach if you don't have a listening ears and that's that's where that's where i would end yeah uh, okay, uh, I agree. It's a very, very tricky uh, question, and uh, uh, in fact, I don't, I don't really have an answer. But I would say something that could appear contradictory to what Omar just said. But in fact, I would say maybe the lesson is not to read uh, the past and history with the eyes of the present and the prejudices. I mean, the the, the prejudgments of the present. Not to, let's say. Uh, make a, a, an a posteriori reading of events. Uh, I think this is probably the most important in order to, to build a, a, a real memory. 
it is not contradictory to what Omar said. It could sound contradictory, but it's not the same. I mean, you can't read the history of, for example, the Holocaust under in World War II with the lenses of the Arab-Israeli conflict. This this would lead you to something that is not only false historically, but dangerous politically. And, and this is very important. Um, the, the other point has to do with what Ernesto said. Maybe I, I would maybe advise uh, to, to read more and to, to think about the real plight of, of people, of ordinary people, and maybe read more novels and see more films and read more comics than read arid historical books. Sometimes it gives you a better clue of, of what really happened for people than reading a, a, a textbook or a treatise or an essay. But I know that this is not something that would be welcome by the community of professors. <laughs> I agree with you. I agree 100% with you. <laughs> I agree 100%. <laughs> totally. Um, and thank you all. Uh, I, I really appreciate everything that we've learned today in the audience. To echo Omar, you can't teach without a listener. And um, we've all benefited from your insights and approach and knowledge and perspectives. Christina, I'll hand it back to you. And again, thank you so much for this opportunity. Mm -hmm. uh, thank you, everyone, and uh, especially our speakers, Joseph, Omar, and, uh, and Ernesto, and our moderator, Alexis, and uh, you, we, we learned something more about the blind spots, and at the end we found out that the blind spots uh, is uh, World War II itself, and, uh, and also this is something... Uh, um, like it's interesting discussion and, and it's, it's new things that we learned and, and I'm sure also teachers uh, also had uh, taken some tips and something broad will bring from this discussion. Um, and uh, once again, I would like to remind, you know, people who would like or in the audience, someone would like to have some more questions answered. Uh, you can also uh, write to us and we will direct those questions to, to Alexis and to, to the speakers. Um, and here I would also would like to encourage to follow our uh, Facebook and uh, soon we will also have our uh, website for Confronting Memories History Program. And that's where you will find also about, uh, out about our upcoming events. And also you can find this new lessons that we designed or the teachers designed based on the multi-perspectivity approach. So you can, you can read them and you can see, you know, how, how, um, these uh, lessons were made, uh, especially in the context of the Eastern Europe and, 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 and Russia. So thank you all and uh, have a good day and uh, evening and until next time. Bye bye.